So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this webinar on how to pre-think assumptions. My name is Raja Sadana. I'm one of the co-founders of EGMAT, and I'm going to be your main host today. Supporting me in this webinar is Harsha. Harsha is a senior subject matter ex expert at EGMAT, and he's going to be your co-host. We also have Sandeep, who's a GMAT strategy expert, and he is also going to be your co-host today. In this webinar, we're going to talk about pre-thinking. Pre-thinking uh, is 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 a uh, is a method which is extremely popular in in um, yeah, when it comes to uh, uh, solving critical reasoning questions, it's a method that that we, we kind of refined and invented uh, in 2012. And um, if you look at data on GMAT Club, you're going to find that uh, um, that about 80 percent of the people who actually needed help in pre-thinking and ended up scoring a 700, they used pre-thinking as as a means to to getting there. Uh, in this webinar, my goal really is to take you from that, you know. Uh, 0 to, to 60 when it comes to pre-thinking and then to give you a path from 60 to 90 uh, percentile in, in, in when using pre-thinking. Um, it was a fairly application-focused webinar. We will go through some foundation, but 80% but of the time we're going to spend on, on applying pre-thinking and solving some really challenging questions. And to make sure that you're prepared for, uh, for this webinar, we did send a few video lessons here where they are on the top left-hand corner. If you've not gone through these video lessons, um, you can go through them. Um, they are a part of your free trial. Um, so when you log into eGMAT.com, you should have access to these video lessons. Okay. Uh, with that, we have some um, upcoming free webinars as well. We have a, a webinar on algebra. That's tomorrow. Um, in this, we're going to talk about inequalities and absolute value. We're going to, again, start from the very basics and, and, and um, uh, go to the most advanced topics. So if you've not registered for this webinar and if you'd like to join this webinar, I'd recommend uh, that you click on this register now button. Uh, and then let's just make sure we increase the marker size a bit more. Then we have a GMAT strategy webinar that is uh, next Saturday, uh, about a week from now. Uh, in this webinar, we're going to help you create your personalized study plan. We're going to look at how to define metrics if you want to get to a score of 730, 740, 760 or so. And then how should you study so that you track those metrics. Again, if you have not registered for that one, you can click on this and, and register for that. Now, a lot of EG matters actually like to give back, and one of the ways of giving back is to to come help answer your questions. And and um, and every week we have either one or two two webinars where we we bring back ex EG matters um, and and then who are currently studying at top B schools and talk about uh, uh, talk about how they actually made that journey, starting from you know uh, getting uh, getting a top score on the GMAT to to get into getting into a top school. So um, this week we have Ayush who's going to talk about how he got into Columbia and Ross uh, and why he chose Columbia over Ross and how did he secure that $80,000 scholarship. So that's um, on our YouTube channel. Um, if you've not registered for this one, again, click on that. Um, Ayush is a, a CFA holder, so someone with the finance backgrounds. Um, uh, so he's going to talk about what role did a CFA play and, and again, what are some of the other factors that uh, made him consider Columbia over a bunch of other schools. All right, with that, let's get to the crux of this webinar. Uh, let's get uh, get to know you guys a bit better. My first question is, when do you guys plan to take the GMAT? And my second question is, what is your target GMAT score? All right. So when do you plan to take the test? I have about 280 odd responses, um, uh, or 225 responses, and about 40% of you have not taken a date as of yet. Presumably you're still preparing, uh, or you've just started preparing for the test. Another 30% um, have their test in about a month and a half to, to two and a half months, and then about 30% of you are in, in that zero to 45 days, with, with about 14 of you who have their test right away. With regards to the target GMAT score, the 730 to 750 bracket seems to be the most popular one, um, uh, about 46% of you there. And then um, the 760 or higher, and 710, 720, almost equally popular. And then we have about 4% of the folks uh, who are in, in, in the 600 to 700 bracket. Now, 
it's uh, if you're aiming for a high score uh, i think if you're aiming for a top school aiming for a high score makes sense because uh, this uh, application season is expected to be even more competitive than last year which by the way was the most competitive application session for for the decade so uh, so that's that's good to know all right with that let's go right into the into the meat of this uh, into this of the session so by the way can you guys see the presentation that says uh, let's discuss your current approach to cr so hold on all right so there's essentially three parts to this webinar and the, i'm going to skip the first part uh, where we talk about your mba uh, let me broadcast results so I can really see so that all of you can see that it's visible. I'm going to uh, I'm going to skip the first part. I'm going to go right into the second part uh, over here. So we're going to skip this first part. This is the part that we're going to go into. And 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 throughout the second part, what I want you to do is you know stay focused on the content that's been talked about. If you have questions um, which are relevant to the content, please ask those questions in the Q&A pod. The Q&A pod is right below the presentation pod. Um, that way, you know, your, your uh, uh, you, Harsha or Sandeep can respond to your questions and, and, and we still go on with the session. And then towards the end, if you have questions which are a bit more personal, questions about your GMAT prep, uh, about, about, you know, your, your choice of business schools, about post-MBA careers, I'd be happy to answer those questions as long as they are in that last part of, uh, uh, of the webinar. Uh, so... Just uh, this is how I look, by the way. We, I, I know, you know, given the number of students over here, I prefer not to turn my webcam on. But I do recommend that um, if you've not connected with me on on LinkedIn, you know, uh, you you should connect with me on LinkedIn. We we add we, we publish about five articles a week related to GMAT and MBA, and and so that it's going to be a good way for you to stay updated with uh, with all things eGMAT and all things B school. Also, uh, we have about eighteen thousand current students, uh, students who are at current B schools uh, connected with me, it will be a good opportunity for you to connect to them through me as well. Okay, so the agenda for today. So we're going to look at you know, how you approach assumption questions today. The, the, the purpose of this session is learning pre-thinking through assumption questions. Our focus is going to be just on assumption questions, even though the pre-thinking approach uh, gels really well and, and uh, while solving evaluate strength and we can logically complete and in fact even bold face questions it's just an adapt we adapt the approach for assumption to these question types uh, so we're going to look at how you approach assumption questions today we, then we're going to do a pre-thinking exercise uh, where um, uh, we, we're going to solve one argument uh, three arguments one after the other and then we're going to do um, we're going to apply the pre-thinking approach that we have learned in step number two on two full length difficult uber difficult official questions and again we're going to solve these questions as a quiz which means you're going to do them one after the other then we're going to do a detailed review where we'll apply both pre-thinking and the negation test and then from this point on this is where you hit that 60th percentile that i talked about earlier um, we're going to really look at how do you go from where you are today to that 90th percentile what is what stops you from from getting to that 90th percentile and 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 how can you uh, bridge that gap Okay, so with that, let's get started. So at a very high level, we're going to look at how uh, you pr you approach assumption questions today, and then uh, then we're going to look at what's important to to master assumptions, and then we're going to look at what your should be approach should be. So uh, so with that, let's kind of discuss your current approach to critical reasoning. Um, now, before I ask what your current approach is, I want to precisely define what pre thinking is. Pre-thinking is thinking of one assumption, one potential assumption. Now, an argument can have many assumptions, uh, many good assumptions that are, that is, we are only concerned about thinking one potential assumption in your mind now. And once you become a skilled pre-thinker, you'd be able to do this in about 15 seconds. Um, and you do this before looking at the answer choices. The moment you look at answer choices, you can throw assumption out of the window. That's, it's, it's essentially uh, not, uh, pre-thinking out of the window, I'm sorry. That's not going to work. Um, now, 
as a term, pre-thinking has existed uh, for about 15 years in, in, in the GMAT world. But a lot of people um, consider pre-thinking as the same as predicting the answer, and, and which it isn't, by the way. Um, a lot of people think, you know, when you're pre-thinking is like that black magic where you're saying this is what the answer is going to be. No, pre-thinking is a means to understand uh, the logic that the author uses uh, to arrive at the conclusion. Okay, we were the first company to precisely define pre-thinking. We are in our third generation of of of, of the pre-thinking process, and 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 so this is something that uh, you should really take take away from this. Pre-thinking is not the same as predicting the answer. We are not trying to predict what's going to be there in the answer choices. We are just going. Pre-thinking is is a test for us to understand that the logic that the author uses to arrive at um, at at his conclusion. Now your pre-thought answer might not be there in the answer choices and that's okay, why? Because once you understand the logic that the author uses, you're gonna find that when you see another correct answer, it becomes really easy to choose that other correct answer, okay? And and, and how popular is pre-thinking? Um, you know, when you look at the 700 plus scores that are reported on GMAT Club between Jan 1st to April 30th, uh, 2021, what you're gonna find is um, a majority of them are reported by EG Matters, by the way. Um, and again, this is including all the partners over here. Um, uh, and, and, and essentially, if you look at the verbal related scores, this number actually goes to about 80% of all, all scores because most of the TTP scores are for, for quant. Okay, and, and this includes over here, others includes pretty much uh, um, every other partner that has ever at us, Prep Manhattan, Prep, and so on and so forth. So this is how powerful pre-thinking is. A lot of those, these scores are powered by pre-thinking. Okay. So how do you approach assumption questions today? There are two ways in which people do that. One is they read the argument, uh, they go to the answer choices, and then come back to the argument, do that back and forth between the argument and the answer choice, choice uh, till they actually reach a final candidate. The second is they read the argument, they pre-think an assumption, and, and then go to the answer choices. And, and they come back only as needed. So um, let's look at this. Which methodology do you use? Let me bring in that poll question here. Which methodology do you use? I'm going to remove broadcast results so till I get about a hundred odd responses. I have about 94, 96, 101. Let's get to a few more responses. Three, two, and one. Okay, but 43% of you use methodology one where you do back and forth between the answer choices. But 57% of you should use the, uh, the, the pre-thinking approach, which is methodology two. My goal today would be for those of you who are using methodology one to tell you what, me what, what the pre-thinking approach is um, and, and, and you know uh, make you give the pre-thinking approach a try. For those of you who use methodology today, I want to make you better pre-thinkers and, and make sure that, that you know, we reach that next level of ability um, uh, post this webinar. Okay, so now, while pre-thinking is a method, um, we want to focus on certain skills when it comes to pre-thinking. Um, the first thing that we want to focus on is, um, is is this concept of visualizing the conclusion. Um, why? Because a lot of people, when they solve assumption questions they, or, or any critical reasoning or even reading comprehension questions, they actually do it very mechanically. And, and the reason for that is because uh, uh, you know, when they talk to experts, experts talk about teaching people tricks to solve questions, and those tricks typically uh, focus on, in RC, for example, reading the first paragraph or, or the first line very, very quickly, or, or really just focusing on, on, on uh, rejecting answer choices by focusing on, on words such as only, and then saying, okay, only is not going to be there as part of the correct answer. So because a lot of experts focus on tricks, people don't focus on reading things properly. And one thing that I want you to focus on is this piece called visualize. Whenever you read an argument, you know, I want you to read and visualize what you've read in, in your own words. If needed, take examples. And we're going to do that. I'm going to demonstrate that uh, uh, throughout this session. Okay. One thing that I especially want you to visualize is, is, is the conclusion 
in your own words. Why? Because once you visualize the conclusion, you would know exactly what the author is talking about. And once you know exactly what the author is talking about, that's half the battle. The other reason where people make a mistake is they kind of rush through answer choices. They, 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 they read an answer choice and then they really, without visualizing, they ask, is this the correct answer? And when that happens, their mind goes blank. Am I correct? Has this happened with anyone? You rush through the answer choice, you ask, is this the correct answer? And you don't know, it seems like the correct answer, right? And, and, and so, so the other piece that I want you to do is read slowly, visualize, okay? So, so just purely from a reading standpoint, okay? The second piece is spend time to build the logic that the author uses to arrive at, at the conclusion. It's like ask yourself, even before looking at the answer choices, again, this is another habit that people have where they, they just want to get done with the question. They don't enjoy doing critical reasoning and, and they say, okay, let me just get to the next question and the next question and the next question. Enjoy critical reasoning. Take it as a, as a fun challenge and, um, and, and, and focus on the beauty of the logic that's used. I mean, the critical reasoning questions are beautifully designed. Those who do well in critical reasoning can, can actually be very um, balanced in their analysis of, um, of, of information that's presented to them. So, so focus on understanding this logic. And then the third piece, which is kind of the, the, in the part that the, fundam the foundation on which the session is based is building this thing called the falsification question. Now, I will tell you this, this is the easiest thing to do. This is kind of the simplest thing if you do this and this right. And by the way, if you don't do visualize or, or un if you don't understand the logic, you might be able to formulate the falsification question, you will still falter. Okay, These are the fundamentals and, and this is, is the process piece over here. And that's really important for you to understand. You need all three to get the question right, uh, but, but, but Visualize and understanding are the things that will, will that's that kind of lay the foundation. Do we have enough time to read slowly? Actually, that's a, a a worry that a lot of people have. And you know the stats that I showed you, where where we accounted for about seventy five to eighty percent of all success should uh, should add some weight to my advice. The thing that happens on the G matters when you read slowly. You don't reread, and when you don't reread, you actually end up saving a lot of time. And let me ask this: I have about 250 people over here. Reading doesn't take time; it's rereading. It's reading the prompt again and again is where you consume time. Am I correct? How many of you, when you're confused, read this again and again? So when you read slowly, you actually negate the need to reread. People who go slow on on the GMAT, whether it's quant or verbal, actually are the ones who score high. All right, here's another question, which is there, which a lot of people really have this. Should we visualize in our own mind and in our It's a great question. Or, or write down important things that are given. Uh, there's no one correct answer to this. If your mind's being overwhelmed, write it down. This means you've not built that brain capacity yet and the word yet being key. And so, so it's important to be able to visualize whether you write it down or not as, as, as secondary. Why? Because initially you might have to write it down and initially most of you will have to write it down. But a time will come when, when you find that your brain can absorb it. You don't need to write it down. On the other hand, if you don't write it down initially, you, you don't build up that capacity. You don't get questions right. You don't build up that confidence you always end up rushing through and you get frustrated. So great question, Ananya. Uh, the, my answer is your brain will tell you whether you need to write it down. If your brain's telling you you need to write it down, then you do right now. It's the same way, which is that, hey, you need two years to, 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 uh, to finish your MBA, but once you do your MBA, you can make $10 million decisions in probably two weeks. You need those two years to set that rigor, to have that rigor set in. But once that rigor does set in, you can make really good decisions, at least if you go to a good B school um, in, in, in a couple of weeks. Everything in life works that way, by the way. All right, with that, let's go on to assumptions and, and say, what is an assumption? And to make sure that you guys have an innate understanding of assumption, I have this wonderful, simple argument that, that each one of you, is that's close to your heart. 
Read this argument and tell me what does the author assume here. You can put your answer in the short answer part. Once I see 30 answers, I'm going to broadcast the result. Here's the argument, Joe scored 500 on the GMAT, and then the author says, therefore, he will not get admission in an Ivy League college. What do you think is, is the assumption? Okay, let's get a few more responses. I have 28, 32, 36. Let me broadcast results. You can see. So I have I have two categories of responses. Actually, the third category, which is a very small proportion of you. But the first category is you need more than 500 to get to an Ivy League school. The second category is is that I say, hey, your GMAT score is the only determinant when it comes to getting into an Ivy League school. And we're going to really look at which one of these is correct. There's a third, which is, you know, a very small proportion of you have said that, which is, hey, score of 500 is not, you know, a great score or so. It's a bad score. Okay. So uh, I'm going to give you five to 10 seconds to read through it, I think, just or, or skim through it. Um, okay. So with that, let's kind of go through this. What's going on? Uh, uh, in this argument. So the author gives you a data point. This is a data point, a score of 500 on the GMAT. Based on this data point, the author makes a claim. He makes a prediction. This is, you know, a claim in the future. He's saying he will not get its future tense into admission into an Ivy League college. There's a logical jump that happens over here. And while making that logical jump, the author makes an assumption. What is the assumption that he makes? A score of 500 for someone like Joe is unacceptable to Ivy League colleges. And, and this some, someone like Joe is really important. Why? Because in the conclusion, the author says he will not get an admission in an Ivy League college. Okay. The author doesn't say that the prince of Saudi Arabia won't get admission with a score of 500 in an Ivy League college. In fact, the prince of, in reality, the prince of Saudi Arabia does get admission in an Ivy League college with that score of 500. Uh, and, and so, so most of you actually got this right, where you say, hey, Ivy League colleges need more than a score of 500. That's, that's wonderful. Over here, just a very short piece. Just focus on the element in the conclusion, which is Joe, and, and map that element to the assumption while figuring that logic out. But, but one thing that this shows is that if you understand this situation, this is a simple argument. It's something that's very easy for you to visualize. It's something that you probably think about day in and day out, not the score of 500, but getting into an Ivy League college. Um, and, and, and because you can easily visualize it, you can arrive at the assumption very easily. So again, that emphasis on visualization. Okay. So with that, can you tell me what an assumption is? What is the definition of an assumption? Can you type it out? What is an assumption? And please uh, the, put your question in the short answer pod, which is on the right hand side of your screen, not in the Q&A pod. The Q&A pod is for your questions, not for your responses. Okay, I have about 54 responses. Um, so what is the definition of an assumption? Okay, and I have some good answers. Uh, that are there and, and I have about 70% of the answers that are what I call as imprecise and, and not great answers. So something that connects premise to the conclusion, yes, an assumption does connect premise to the conclusion. That's not the complete definition of an assumption um, uh, in, in that case. Uh, it's the same as saying who's a rich person, someone who has a car. Yes, or, you know, pretty much every rich person has a car, but not everyone who has a car is a rich person. That's kind of the same way. Some an unstated fact. Yes, an assumption is an unstated fact, yet an argument can have hundreds of unstated facts or even unstated claims. Only a couple of them would be assumptions. So, so that's there. Um, something that the conclusion relies on for, and something that must be true for the conclusion to be true. That is actually the precise definition of an assumption. 
So what is an assumption? An assumption is an unstated idea that must satisfy this must be true condition. What condition for what? For the conclusion to be valid. So an assumption plays on the validity of that conclusion and says, hey, what information that's not stated in the argument and that cannot be inferred from the argument is required or is must be true if I want to keep the conclusion valid. Okay. So in, in many ways, an assumption, if you were to make this a bit more explicit, satisfies two traits. One is it provides information that is either not explicitly stated or it can't be inferred from the argument. And the second thing is it satisfies this one very, very stringent condition that is the must be true condition. Now, a majority of the times when you make a mistake in assumption question, that's going to be because you don't understand the must be true condition uh, required uh, for an assumption to satisfy. And we're going to spend about 80% of the session on this. And every question that we solve, we're going to go back on, on, on visualizing uh, the must be true condition in the context of the argument that we are discussing. In about 7% of the questions, the, the test also plays on, on this new information where the an answer choice, an incorrect answer choice will have, uh, you know, a must be true condition. It will satisfy a must be true condition, but it will provide information that you can infer from the factual part of the argument. It doesn't provide any new information. So we'll solve one question, which, which one official question that plays on this as well. Okay. Um, now, if you want to visualize, and Anichi might be very big on visualizing, and, 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 and to that you say, what is, how do we figure out must be true versus a supporting statement? Why? Because that's kind of what a strengthener versus an assumption is. The way to visualize this is to visualize a house. This entire house is your argument, and consider that roof as your conclusion. When you think of this, you have these three pillars that are supporting the roof that kind of help keep this roof upright or, or prevent the roof from caving in. Each of these three pillars are premises. Why? Because they're supporting the roof, supporting the conclusion. Not, But each one of them may not be an essential pillar. Only one of these pillars may be required to prevent that roof from, from caving in. And that essential pillar is, is what we call as an assumption. That is an assumption. Um, each of these three, by the way, are perfectly good strengtheners. An assumption is a really good strengthener, is, is a perfectly correct strengthener as well, but every strengthener or every supporting statement or every statement that increases your belief in the conclusion is not an assumption. Why? Because every statement that increases your belief in the conclusion will not satisfy that must be true condition. And Navdeep says, how can you differentiate between must be true and not always true? Navdeep, that's what the entire session is going to be uh, based on. So we're going to take probably 10 examples to demonstrate that, including a couple that are coming right away. So what does must be true mean? What must be true means is if the information provided by assumption, if this new information provided by assumption is not true, then the conclusion can no longer hold true or the conclusion can be invalidated. Or in other means, the assumption must be true is required for that conclusion to remain valid. Okay, and let's kind of take an example over here. We're going to take the same example and we're going to look at the, the statement that we said um, as, 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 as a conclusion, uh, as, as, a, as a good assumption, I'm sorry. Same argument, Joe scored 500 on the GMAT and the author then says, therefore, he will not get admission in an Ivy League college. So then the first thing we really say is, what does it mean that the conclusion is falsified or is invalidated? In what scenario is the conclusion falsified? The very simple answer is, if Joe gets admission with a score of 500, then the conclusion is falsified. Is that clear to everyone? If Joe gets admission with a score of 500, then that conclusion is falsified. The author can no longer say with 100% certainty that he will not get admission in an Ivy League college. Right? Okay. So let's figure out how do we evaluate whether an answer choice satisfies that must be true condition or is that correct answer choice? And, and, and again, the, the information that you saw on the last card, I'm going to repeat that again and again. So don't worry about it. So let's look at this answer choice that we said was the correct answer choice, which is a score of 500 on the GMAT for someone like Joe is unacceptable to Ivy League colleges. So then the question that we are asking is this one, is that must be true? Will Joe get admission, which is a conclusion breakdown condition, if this statement over here, or rather, I'm sorry, this statement over here is no longer true? So let's kind of do that. 
So when we say that a statement is no longer true, then automatically what we are saying is that its negated version becomes true. And this is a really important point for you to understand and visualize. So when we say this is no longer true, okay, then what we are really saying is that this automatically becomes true. And what's the negated instance of this? That a score of 500 of, on the GMAT for someone like Joe becomes acceptable to Ivy League colleges. When that happens, then does Joe get admission into an Ivy League college when the score becomes acceptable? Absolutely yes, right? Because if we say that the score is acceptable, then the author cannot say with 100% certainty that Joe will not get admission into an Ivy League college. Can you see how the conclusion breaks down here? in the presence of this negated instance. Can you see that? Okay, now some of you may be wondering, Rajat, how can you say that if this statement is not true, this automatically becomes true? Many of you must be wondering. So let's kind of take some examples to, to, to demonstrate that. And by the way, what we did was applying the, uh, we applied the negation test. Okay, so if you say a statement is not true, which means it's, uh, it's not there, then it's neg you automatically saying its negated version is true. How do we say that? If you say Harvard has the best MBA program, and if you say that statement is not true, then by itself, what is it that you're saying? Harvard does not have the best MBA program, or that an MBA program that is better than or as good as Harvard exists. Think about it, read this again. Are you, if you say this is not true, are you not saying this automatically? Type in yes or no. If you're saying this is not true, you're saying this automatically. This is the negated version of, of, of this. Right? Let's kind of take another statement. John runs faster than David. If you say this is not true, what you're automatically saying is that John does not run faster than David, or David is just as fast, or David is faster than John. So when you say a statement is not true, then you're automatically saying that its negated version is true. That's uh, that's kind of by definition. If you say Apple is not the uh, iPhone is not the best phone, you're automatically saying that there's an i there's a phone that's as good as an i as the iPhone or better than the iPhone that exists. Okay. So this is must be true, which means that if an answer choice is sat is is a must be true answer choice, which means it's the correct assumption, then what is going to happen is that in the presence of its negated version, that that conclusion will break down. Again, let's visualize this. If that pillar is an essential pillar, then what's going to happen when you remove that pillar? What's going to happen to the roof? When you remove that pillar? If that pillar is an essential pillar in that house, the roof will fall, right? That's what should happen. This is exactly what this is. Okay. In the presence of the negated version, which means negated, presence of negated version means removing the pillar, the roof will cave in. Okay, and then so that's kind of that's how simple this is, but you have to visualize if you want to make it this simple, and you have to spend time visualizing if you want to make it this simple. Okay, now it also applies the other way. By the way, if an answer choice is not must be true, which means if it's the incorrect answer choice, it's one of those answer choices that's confusing you. And for those of you who say it's confusing, you probably have not gone through the the foundation files. Okay. Um, by the way, I'm not going to teach you tricks. So, so you've got to use and apply yourself. Can I go a bit slow? I'm actually teaching you the fundamentals of assumption. I'm not even gone into pre-thinking. Okay. So, so if you want me to go through slow, if you think this is too fast, I would recommend you go on to egmat.com, go into the fundamentals of assumptions. There we go. Absolutely uh, slow, by the way. And, and then watch the recording. Okay. Because if I go slow, uh, I'm going to alienate about 80% of the class that has done this. Okay. All right. So let's go to must be true over here. The other part of must be true. And again, I'm going to repeat this again and again and again. So even if you don't get it now, you're going to get it because this is critical reasoning is like physics. If you know the fundamental laws, you can pretty much solve any question, whether it's an easy question or it's the most challenging question out there.
Okay. So let's go back and repeat this. If an answer choice is the incorrect answer choice, then the conclusion will not break down in the presence of negated instance. Now write it down. I'm going to give you five to ten seconds. Have a piece of paper, write it down. If it's the incorrect answer choice, okay. And I'm going to give you the PDF as well, by the way. All of this you're going to get in, towards the end. Write this down. If the, it's, if the incorrect, if it's an incorrect answer choice, the conclusion will not break down in the presence of the negated instance. Okay. So let's take the same example, and we're going to do this 20 times in this webinar. We're going to take the two other assumption answers that you guys gave in and we're going to really tell them how we're going to evaluate whether they satisfy or whether they uh, whether they satisfy uh, this this must be true test okay same argument joe scored 500 on the gmat therefore he will not get admission in an ivy league college okay so let's kind of look at evaluate this option a score of 500 on the gmat is not a good score and let's ask ourselves is that a valid assumption does it satisfy the must be true condition Let's look at this. We're going to ask the same piece over here. Is this must be true? Uh, or, okay, in the same question, will the conclusion become invalid if the statement to the left no longer holds true? So, again, the same thing. If this no longer holds true, if the statement to the left no longer holds true, then what holds true? Can you write it down? What did we say last time? If this no longer holds true, then what holds true automatically? It's negated version, yes. And what is the negated version? As one of you said, a score of 500 on the GMAT becomes a good score, right? Now, ask, let's ask ourselves, if a score of 500 on the GMAT becomes a good score, then does Joe get admission? No, Joe doesn't get admission into an Ivy League college, even if this is considered a good score. Why? Because when you look at this argument, this is not predicated on the fact that what you call the score, whether it's a good score, an excellent score, a bad score, or a terrible score. It's just the author is giving you a fact saying, Joe scored 500 on the GMAT, and then based on this fact, he's making this claim. In fact, the logic of the argument would remain the same if you replace 500 by 700. It's just the same logic. Joe would, um, over there, Joe would still not get admission with a 700 if this were replaced by 700. So this is how you say, hey, this is not a must be true. Okay. All right. Some of you really said this question, which is which is that GMAT score is the only determinant of getting in to an Ivy League school. How many of you gave that as an option? The GMAT score, your GMAT score is the only determinant or, or the only thing that's important to get into an Ivy League school. Select yes. If you or, or type in yes if you said that. Actually, you should have a yes no poll here. All right, many of you said that. Let's kind of evaluate that piece over here. Is that must be true? Okay, let's evaluate this, the same piece. And I'm going to broad, remove broadcast results. So this answer choice is, 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 is basically, you know, a, a play on the same logic that you guys used to say that, hey, essays are not as important or are not, they don't play a significant role. Okay, so let's kind of look at this. The quality of an applicant's essay does not play a significant role in deciding whether the applicant gets into an Ivy League school or not. So, so let's kind of look at this. What is what is the negated version of this? What is the negated version of this? What is the negated version? It does play a significant role, absolutely. SS play a significant or an important role, equally good. Now, tell me one thing. Will Joe get admission if the minimum score required is, is, is 700? Will Joe get admission with a score of 500 if the minimum score required is 700 and you also need great SS? No, Joe will not get admission. Right? So is that must be true? Is that must be true? Let me clear all answers. Is this must be true? Then no, it does. It isn't. Which also would falsify the same statement. Ivy League's only accept scores higher than seven five, than five hundred is 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 essentially the same as our the correct option that we used. Yes, that that would be a correct option for people like Joe again being there. 
So basically we have to negate all options. No, we, I'm just teaching you what an assumption is. Okay, I'm not telling you the process of solving questions. At EG Mat, we go slow. Why? Because to excel, you've got to go slow. You've got to build that fundamentals. Okay. So again, the three skills that we have, this is, this was just a, a foundation onto what an assumption is. We've not gone on to pre-thinking. We've not started pre-thinking. Now you guys know what an assumption is, what a must be true aspect of an assumption is. Hopefully you guys have a better idea of what must be true. is. Some of you probably are still confused and that's okay. Uh, because that confusion is going to go away in two more examples. But many of you now have a better idea of what a must be true condition is. Okay. Now, what I want you to focus on as we go into more sophisticated arguments, the first argument was a very simple argument. As you go into more sophisticated arguments, I want you to focus on visualizing, visualizing, visualizing. I will say this again and again till you are sick of it and then I'll say it 10 more times because only then you would visualize. Then I want you to focus on the understanding the logic. Visualizing happens on a, on a singular statement. Understanding the logic combines those statements. And then I want you to go towards that falsification question. One, two, three. Don't go to three without doing one. Don't go to two without doing one. Okay. So again, as a takeaway, if you see a correct answer choice, the conclusion will not hold true in the presence of its negated version. For the incorrect answer choice, the conclusion will continue to hold true in the presence of its negated version. This is not the process. I don't want you to negate every answer choice, just to be very clear. This is just teaching you the principle. That's basically it. Now I'm going to teach you the process in the next uh, uh, 25 minutes or so. How should you approach assumption questions? Okay. So we're going to do a pre-thinking exercise. Here's how we're going to go about it. I'm going to give you an argument. This is a plain argument, no answer choices. All you have to do is read this argument then I'm going to give you two, two and a half minutes to pre-think. I want you to, to apply your understanding of what an assumption is, apply that understanding of must be true and come up with assumptions over here or what do you think is an assumption. This is you approaching assumption in an extremely raw manner. So I want you to, to use your brains and, and, and or rather in fact uh, stress your brains to, to, to doing that. Then I'm going to go about how I think we should do pre-thinking and how we do pre-thinking at each EMAT. And then if need be, we'll evaluate a couple of submissions. But, but typically in the past, when it comes to the way we do pre-thinking um, uh, uh, at each EMAT, once we do it through this, people actually are absolutely clear how to go about doing this. Okay. So with that, do you guys have a pen and paper ready? Do you guys have a pen and paper ready? And a glass of water or a bottle of water. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna re gonna I'm gonna uh, clear all answers, remove broadcast results, and here is your first argument. Good luck, guys. You have two and a half minutes. Tell me what does the author assume here? And from this point on, I'm gonna mute myself for two and a half.
All right, guys, you get those answers in another 20 seconds. I have 14 responses so far. I'm going to give you another 20, 25 seconds. I think we can do better than 14. Again, type your responses, press enter, and once I get to about 30, I have about 22, 23, and again, don't be afraid. What's the worst that can happen? You'd be wrong. And and the only benefit of being wrong is that, that you can only improve from that. 34, 35, great. Let me broadcast results. Okay. Um, I, I want you to read the the... The, the the variety of responses. And and you can see how and I want you to also make sure that you you write this down. To to as to what you put in over here. Okay. So um Criteria for rewarding research doesn't enhance student learning. Uh, you can see these pieces over here. So some some really good uh, 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 attempts over here. I think a couple of them are correct, but but the very fact that you guys have attempted this is very encouraging. It takes a certain amount of courage to pre-think, and and in people who 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 actually end up scoring those 730 scores, they actually have a lot of courage. Why? Because if you don't Try diligently, you don't fail. If you don't fail, you don't know why you're failing, where you're failing. And if you don't figure out why and where you're failing, you're not going to improve. So so with that, let's kind of see how I would approach this uh, this question. Okay. So, so we're going to use what we call as the falsification method, which is the falsification question. This is a method that Pyle Tandon, who's my other co-founder, invented. She invented this in 2017. Um, and and you might see a couple of other prep companies using that method now. It's just been in, you know it's just delivered so much success. Now this is a very simple method. It 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 builds on on that very definition of assumption. What is an assumption? Assumption is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid. Okay, which means if the assumption is not there, there are places that the conclusion will break down. So if you were to think about and if you go back to our our, our visualization of of that roof. Um, and the essential pillar, without that essential pillar, that, that that roof actually caves in. So where do you put that essential pillar? You put that essential pillar where the roof is caving in. You figure out where the roof is caving in, and then you put an essential pillar over here. So if you have to figure out what an assumption is, you have to figure out scenarios where the conclusion breaks down, given the information that's there in the argument. And once you know those scenarios, your assumption is that those scenarios are not possible. That's basically it. Does that make sense? What you, given what you know about an assumption, let's figure out where is it that the conclusion breaks down. How can I break the conclusion down? And then my assumption is going to build around those scenarios in which the conclusion breaks down. Why? Because an assumption, by definition, is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid. Okay. So the one question that you have to ask is. Under what circumstances, given the facts in the argument, will the conclusion break down? Write this down. Okay. Now, there's one caution that I have for you. A lot of people say, oh, I've got this, this wonderful question. I'm going to actually be able to solve every assumption question correctly. And you will, assuming you do that visualization on that logical structure. If you don't do the visualization uh, of each statement, if you don't connect statements using the logical structure, you can apply this question all you want, you will still not get the answer. Okay. So let's kind of look at this, this argument over here. And, 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 uh, and I want you to tell me which statement is the main conclusion. Let me I'm going to bring in a poll question, and in this poll question, you have four statements. Please ignore statement number four because it's not there. Uh, but but which statement, according to you, between one, two, and three, is the main conclusion? It's really important to be able to identify the main conclusion 
if you were to answer an assumption question because you should know what is the roof that you're trying to to prevent from um, from caving in so which statement is the main conclusion is really important for you to know three i have about a hundred answers or so well about 90 answers uh, so far let's get at least 120 responses guys which statement is the main conclusion here 60 okay i have 120 responses now really good thank you let me broadcast results and end the poll but 49 percent that's 65 so we have about 132 odd responses um, uh, uh, saying that statement two is the main conclusion and you guys are absolutely correct statement two is indeed the main conclusion this is what the author wants you to believe by definition the main conclusion is what the author wants you to take away from the argument and in this case what the author wants you to take away from the argument is is statement number two over here which is that the difference between professors in the tenure system and other full-time lecturers has to do with the reward system for the former reward system for for the former being the professors over here okay or the tenure faculty that that term is being used interchangeably over here okay so this is what the author wants you to believe a lot of people think statement one is the main conclusion because they have this word called concludes uh, over here remember this your main conclusion is always 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 by the author this is a conclusion made by a paper a published paper and and the author's conclusion is based on the the conclusion made by by the published paper it's not the main conclusion this statement over here is merely a factual piece of information okay again remember the main statement satisfies two criteria a it's by the author oh, sorry the main conclusion satisfies or the arguments conclusion satisfies two criteria it is by the author number one and number two it's what the author wants you to take away from this okay so let's kind of visualize this okay so visualize the main conclusion here oops sorry about that sorry about that can you guys hear me clearly just type in yes or no my computer just went into the lockdown mode briefly can you guys hear me clearly perfect thank you all right let's visualize this conclusion here so the, the statement says the difference between professors in in the tenure system and other full-time lecturers um, has to do with the reward system for the former okay we're going to talk about the third statement hold on hold your horses okay so so we're going to talk about the third statement and the role it plays okay so what the author is saying is i agree that 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 lecturers uh, provide you know uh, improve the student learning better than 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 tenured professors do but he says that you know the reason why that happens is is because of the reward system that we have for professors he's saying blame that reward system for for this difference in learning that's what what the author is saying can everyone understand the statement what well, the author the author is not disputing the the report's finding they're saying the reason why that happens is because of the reward system the author is blaming that reward system okay so that's really important over here so this statement is the main conclusion now let's talk about statement number three over here the criterion for rewarding tenured faculty places a greater emphasis on research than on teaching what's the purpose of this statement statement number three why do you think statement number three is there the reason why statement number three is here is because it wants the is, is supporting information um, to make statement number two more believable okay it's supporting information it's there to make main uh, uh, ma the main argument more believable the main conclusion more believable okay so it gives more information about the reward system for the professors so i think that's another piece so for those of you who are saying can you tell me what does statement number three do is that does that answer your question okay it's a it, it's a premise it makes the conclusion more believable okay now i want to ask a question about statement number three specifically statement number three which is that whose reward system does statement three talk about and the options are only tenured faculty 
only lecturers or both tenured faculty and lecturers? Is it only tenured faculty, only lecturers or both tenured faculty and lecturers? And again, these are all areas that you need to achieve to achieve absolute clarity. Why? Because if you don't have absolute clarity over here, you're going to make a mistake. And this is why you need to read slow. This is why you need to visualize. Three, need 120 responses, guys. Whose reward system does statement three talk about? Just tenured faculty, just lecturers, or both tenured faculty and lecturers? 125 and 26 responses. I'm going to end the poll and broadcast the results. Sorry, broadcast the results. And you can see 75% of you say just tenured faculty, and, and but 25% of you say both. And, and it's just tenured faculty. If Let's kind of look at this. The criterion for rewarding whom? Tenured faculty places greater emphasis on, on, on research than on reward. So what it's saying is uh, that word greater, a lot of people are confused with this word greater. Comparisons confuse people in critical reasoning. Okay, Greater is comparing the amount of emphasis on research and on teaching just for, for tenure faculty. And that's where visualization helps. What it's saying is, let's say there's a 70% emphasis on research, okay, research, and there's a 30% emphasis on teaching over here that's all that this is saying there's absolutely no information that we have about the reward uh, uh, um, uh, about the reward system for uh, for 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 lecturers is this clear to everyone and i see some of you are getting ahead which is great but is that clear to everyone statement 3 gives us no information about lecturers it's purely about this and this is where you've got to visualize everything visualize everything let's visualize statement one okay statement one says a recently published paper concludes that tenured faculty or those on their way to tenure enhance student learning less than full-time lectures outside the tenure system do so if i were to root to to, to kind of visualize this i'd say okay uh, for for full-time faculty uh so oh, sorry Full-time lecturers, they enhance student learning by 100 units and tenured faculty enhances student learning by 70 units. That's, that's my tenured faculty TF over here and this is my lecturers over here. That's kind of how I would look at this. And again, visualization uh, is, is, is really, really important and I usually kind of take some numbers or things that, are, that come more naturally to me. But again, identify that there's a comparison here and, and, and when you do comparisons, putting these numbers helps you visualize the comparison, helps you retain that comparison in your mind as you read forward. Similarly, here's another comparison over here. Okay. And, and again, we've spent a lot of time on this, but what you learn from this one argument, you're going to be able to apply this to 10 other arguments over here. Okay. So let's kind of do a logical structure. Statement one provides the context. It's a data point on which... Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the entire argument is or the entire conclusion is based statement two is 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 what the author is trying to assert that's the main conclusion statement three is a supporting statement given to 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 make statement two more believable can you you negate statement three no you can't here is another thing in, in critical reasoning you can't negate facts facts are given to you as a tool Facts cannot be doubted. So you cannot negate statement three. It's against the rules of critical reasoning. Okay. If you want to ask me why that is the case, ask me towards the end of the session because if I go into that journey, I'm going to go on a tangent for about 20 minutes or so. Okay. But you cannot negate facts in critical reasoning questions. Just take it. All right. So let's kind of apply the pre-thinking question. Uh, over here. Under what circumstances, given the facts and the argument, will the conclusion break down? What this translates to, and for those of you who are our EGMAT quant students, you can see the quant process skills of translate and visualize, and con considering all constraints, apply over here as well. Under what circumstances would the reward system not be responsible for the difference in performance? Again, remember, we are not saying that the performance is not different. What we are really saying is, under what circumstances would the reward system not be responsible for the difference in performance given that 
full time lectures enhance student performance more than professors do we know that and the reward system places greater emphasis on research and on teaching okay and this is excellent you guys are already coming up with good assumptions now which is by the way what i have over here let's go here what do i have there are two possible scenarios in which you can't blame the reward system one is if the non tenured faculty has an identical reward system okay if the reward system is identical then you can't really do that do you guys agree this is a scenario in which my conclusion breaks breaks down if both of them have the same reward system then there is something else that's responsible it can't be the reward system right or if people don't if if most tenured faculty doesn't care about the reward system in that case you can't blame the reward system is statement one negating a fact is statement one negating a fact that's given do we know anything about the reward system of non tenured faculty no we talked about that when we discussed statement 3 we don't know anything about the reward system of non tenured faculty okay now can you see can you see in each of these scenarios my conclusion breaks down right can you see the the value of of us doing the conclusion breakdown condition early on understanding that and how we bring this up over here okay so if these are the scenarios in which the conclusion breaks down then let's kind of look at what my assumptions are my assumptions are that non tenured professors or faculty it should be, do not have an identical reward system and most professors should act or should care as per the reward system okay these are the two assumptions and again you guys got this early on you didn't but once you understood the falsification method once you visualized the argument you got this right away okay and this is the power of of visualization and and and, and formulating that falsification question okay so now let's talk about pre thinking and timing how many of you were are worried about timing at this point say hey man this works this is really cool but i'm worried a bit about timing how many of you are okay here's something that i will tell you when it comes to the gmat it's not timing that pulls you back at least not till you hit the 70th percentile okay how many of you heard this piece to really say where people are trying to sell you stuff by saying uh we are going to teach you tricks to save time okay you yeah. have one thing that i will tell you is i don't care if you buy our courses but please don't buy their courses because they don't know how what the test is about okay and and i talked about data in in from from you know 1st of january to to 30th of april this is data for may 2021 and and, and in may 2021 we accounted for 56% of all 700 plus scores all 700 plus scores all of these other companies accounted for 44% in fact if you look at the reviews on gmat club and look at the scores and reviews you're going to find there are two companies that have delivered success it's egmat and ttp no one else has delivered any success okay and again look at the reviews count the reviews per by month and 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 you're going to see that over here okay so how are you going to feel the reason why i'm saying that is i can say something other people can say something what's valid is and what you care about is that 700 plus score uh because pretty much everyone over here is aiming for that 700 plus score okay um in fact not just egmat verbal in the last 3 months egmat quant has delivered more reviews than ttp quant so it's not just verbal and timing yes comes with practice but a specific kind of practice the pra the kind of practice in which you learn to do visualization so here is how you're going to feel in this entire journey when you start let's assume you're starting at this point number 1 where your time to answer questions that's on the x axis is medium and your accuracy is what i call it in the in this low bracket over here okay now 
when you start doing pre-thinking, two things will happen. Your time to answer questions is going to go up and your accuracy is also going to go up, which is where you will go to point number two. And you're going to be like this guy where you're saying, hey man, I'm worried about timing. Why the hell am I trying to use pre-thinking over here? At that point in time, I want you to, 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 to basically believe in the process. I want you to, to believe in that understanding. And this is kind of where the difference between people who understand uh, what it takes to succeed versus people who are worried about success. There are people who are worried about success over here and really say, hey, I just want to get to, to, to score high on the GMAT. They don't, they're not worried about learning. They would give up at this point. But, but there are people who know what it takes to succeed and those people would carry on. And when you carry on, as you build that ability to visualize, as you build, and, and, and what is building that ability to visualize? The moment you see a comparison, uh, the images should start coming in your brain right away. As you build that ability, you'll again see that that accuracy continues to go on and increasing. That time to answer question actually reduces it. It's, it's now below uh, that point number one, which is where you started. Once you hit point number three, you have what I call as you you hit, hit that positive feedback cycle, and and um, and and then you continue to do pre-thinking. At this point, no one can tell you not to do pre-thinking once you hit point number three. Okay. But you will go through this journey. Now, a lot of people really say, why do you think people who are from top schools, whether it's engineering or commerce colleges, why do, why do you think they do well on the GMAT? Why do you think those people do well on the GMAT? People who are from an IIT or an NIT or, or a top commerce college. Okay, logical thinking. There's some sort of thing which is there accuracy reasoning good reasoning skills what's the one of the biggest things that they know of they are hard working that's why they're in IIT I can tell you if you are here with me on a Saturday morning which is I'm in Phoenix Arizona at Saturday morning my time or on a Saturday evening you're equally hard working they can visualize and think logically I can tell you also that probably Half of them can't right away. They learn how to. One of the biggest things that separates those uh, uh, that that separates those who go to IITs or or, or 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 RECs from those who don't is the fact that they are resilient. Not and hardworking and resilience are two different things. The fact that someone's succeeded on a competitive test, uh, what that does is it tells them what does it take to succeed. It tells them what is the level of understanding you need to develop to be able to be successful. Those people know tricks don't work. Okay, that's the biggest difference. It's not, yes, they are more logical than people who've not gone to an IIT, but it's that's not the big difference. The difference is they are way more resilient. And, and 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 they know the they trust the process for them when I if, if I tell someone who's from an I'm from IIT and if I tell someone from from IIT this is what you need to do I don't have to tell that person again because for them the reason they cleared that IIT entrance exam was because they followed you know a very similar logical process when they were preparing for that test and then it, it's it, it's it just makes sense to them and and they persevere through this Here's another thing that I will tell you, and if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, do that. You will see it's the, the world's largest collection of GMAT success stories. And you will see Indians, South Americans, Europeans who don't have perfect English, who, who, who actually struggle to formulate sentences. Those guys have scores of 730, 740, 760. And the reason is because the GMAT's not a test of English, it's a test of logic. And each one of you is a logical thinker. So really, really, really important for you to understand that. It's not a test of speed. It's not a test of logic. It's, a, it's not a test of speed. It's not a test of English. It's a test of logic. You can visualize things logically. You're going to be golden on the GMAT. S to, to back my claims, uh, in addition to the statistical data I, pr uh, I, I produce, here are some statements over here. It says, as one of our students who scored a 740, it says, understand the passage completely. Take your time. Equally important, pre-think and answer before looking at the answer to us. Probably this one word will have the most impact on your GMAT score. 
There's another guy who said, answer CR questions as if there are no answers. So now this guy, Jim Yi, um, he scored a 700. He, really smart guy, He when he scored a 700, he also had a Q51, by the way. You, you've got to be really smart to get a Q51. Uh, and, and But struggled in critical reasoning. Uh, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Chinese Canadian, so native speaker. Um, so he says, when it gets to 700 level questions, you have to do pre-thinking. The reason to do pre-thinking is to help you focus on logic and not deviate from the key argument when trap or out of scope answer choices show up. Okay. And then there's a comment by one of our former students who says, this pre-thinking primes the mind. By the way, this guy got into Columbia and GSP Chicago. His his MBA interview is also there on our YouTube channel as to how he got into GSP Chicago. So this pre-thinking primes the mind and we are constantly on our toes while reading a paragraph or a CR question stem. Apart from comprehending the passage, we keep speculating in which direction the passage will orient or what logical jump has the author taken. Both CR and RC. The same fundamentals apply with regards to that visualization. So we have three more questions and this third question is a very, it's, it, it's something that will seem like a very simple argument but if you don't pre-think, if you don't build that understanding of must be true, the answer choices will completely confuse you. You'll be messed up. So pre-think, if you pre-think, if you understand what that must be true condition is, you would be able to get to the correct answer. It's, 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 a, it's an official question, it's a beautiful question um, uh, with regards to explaining what the value of that must be true statement is. Okay. So here is the question. You guys have three minutes to answer this question. Good luck. All right, guys, last 10 seconds, get those answers in. Five, 
four, three, two, and one. Let me end the poll and let's broadcast the results. So this is how you guys polled. And one of the things guys that is there is, you know, if you're here in this webinar, participate. Um, you know, the, the only way you're going to get most out of this, um, this, this webinar is if you participate. So, so, um, so that's something that, that I would truly recommend. I have 132 people who've responded over here. I probably would have liked to get 150 responses or so. So with that, let's look at these, uh, let's look at how we approach this question. But how are the answer choices? Before I do that, and is this a 700 level question? Yes, it is. Okay, confused between two, very close. There are actually four answer choices that are very close. B, C, D, and E. All of them are good strengtheners. Only one of them is the correct assumption. So B, if you're confused between any two out of B, C, D, or E, you can, you, these are, there are four strengtheners here. All of them are correct strengtheners. Only one is the correct assumption. And this is, this is a beautiful question that, um, that, that un makes you understand what that must be true condition is. So, so let's see uh, what, uh, let's see the, the logical structure of the argument. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that the, the, the revenue generated by the toll highway will go by at least 50% every year. Okay, we're going to do discuss every answer choice, so don't worry about it. Focus on learning here. Okay, so what's given to us currently? We charge ten cents uh, 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 per mile toll, and we are proposing a fifty percent increase to that ten cents per mile toll. Okay, and based on that, there's a there's a claim made by the highway commissioner where he's saying that the revenue will go up by at least fifty percent every year. And again. You've got to visualize this piece over here. What this means is that if, if last year the revenue was $1 million, what is going to be the revenue this year? If last year the revenue was $1 million, the revenue this year is going to be one point, at least 1.5. It could be 1.6, 1.7, it could be 2. So it would be 1.5 plus is what it's going to be. All right. Assuming the repair cost will remain the same. Why does the, do the repair costs matter? In, in my claim, am I really saying that, that will this money be enough to fund the repair costs? Is the highway commissioner making any, any claims around that? No, so the repair costs don't matter. That's just the context. Okay. So, so then how do we calculate, given the information in the argument, and here is the argument, how do we calculate annual revenue? Or how do we estimate annual revenue? What's the formula? How do we estimate annual revenue? In very simple terms. There's no income and expenses here. It's about revenue. Given the information. All right, I have some good Okay, guys, given the context of this argument, the annual revenue, and remember this, it's done on a per mile basis over here. The annual revenue is toll per mile multiplied by the total number of toll miles. That's how you would do that. So do this over here. Look at this. Toll price per multiplied with the number of miles. Does anyone have a problem with this or any questions around this? How we calculate annual revenue is this. Why do you say vehicles? Who says vehicles? Why does 365 matter? Why do the number of cars matter? Are, am I charging on a per car basis? Am I charging on a per day basis? No, I'm charging on a per mile basis. It's distance basis, yes. It's on a per mile basis. Okay, and that's where pre-thinking is really important. 
So if you know this annual revenue, you say under what circumstances would the annual revenue not increase by 50%? Okay, this is my falsification condition. Under what circumstances will the annual revenue not increase by 50% given that we know that this is going to go up by 50%? Under what circumstances will that happen? If we know that this is going to go up by 50%, if the miles travel go down, if the total number of miles travel go down, okay, the distance goes down, that's the only thing. So if that's the only way in which my conclusion will break down, what is my assumption? The total number of miles driven across does not decrease. Everyone with me? That's the only assumption. Okay. What is a must be true condition? Now let's get before I look at the answer choices. What is what's an assumption? An unstated idea that an unstated idea that what's the definition of an assumption? An unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be true. Okay. Now let's look at answer choice B. A lot of you chose choice B over here. The total number of trips made on, on, on the toll highway will not decrease from its current level. Okay, does that mean that the total number of miles traveled will go down? No. It doesn't mean that the total number of miles would go down. Why? Because, um, hey, what if the miles per trip go up? If we reduce the total number of trips, then you can compensate for that by increasing the number of trips. For those of you who chose choice B, so is this a must be true condition? Is this a must be true condition? Number of trips is not the same as number of miles. Who says that? Are you charging per trip? People who chose choice B, is not equal to okay perfect people who chose choice B can you now see why choice B is incorrect people who chose choice B can you now see the the value of figure doing pre-thinking what if annual revenue is number of trips into toll per trips in that case yes it would be but that's not what it is here right My friend, how can you charge by miles? Is that for you to decide? How can you charge by miles if it's given to you? I mean, the argument says it's a toll per trip. Maybe they have cameras all across. Okay, they look at where each, how much each car is going. Okay, choice B, any other doubt? Remember, must be true. It's purely based on must be true. Okay. The correct answer is choice E. Choice E says the total distance traveled by vehicles on toll highway will not decrease from, from this. If the total distance decreases, then the to do the total number of miles decrease? Absolutely. Right? Which is why choice E is my correct answer. Again, it's in line with the pre-thinking. Yeah, don't get influenced by the real world. Any, any doubt on choice E? I'm going to discuss choices C and D as well, but any doubt on choice E? Perfect. Again, this is what pre-thinking does. It takes your attention off the answer choices onto the logic of the argument. Okay. Now, let's look at choice C. Choice C talks about average length of a trip. What if the average length of a trip goes down? What can compensate for that? 
if average length of a trip of the trip goes down by 10 percent more trips can concentrate uh, can, can compensate for that right so is this a must be true is this a must be true then no it's not a must be true it's absolutely not people who chose choice c but 11 percent of you chose choice c can you see that and by the way if you chose choice b c or d these are all good strengtheners if this were a strengthen question then then that's something that then these choices would be true what did you not get the must be true part or or, or is it required let me just kind of take another very very simple example let me just bring in my notes So, here is the piece over here. I'm giving you a statement which says that you need five, year, five years of experience or a 720 score on the GMAT, of course, to, to get into ISB. Then, is this statement a must be true? Everyone sees that? Okay, good. So, what is our... our so again, let's apply this to this particular question. What is our required condition? Required condition Required condition is total number. In this particular argument, the required condition was total number of miles should not go down. Everyone agrees to this? Yeah, right. So So miles per trip, a uh, total number of miles is equal to miles per trip multiplied by the total number of trips. And let me just do this. Now, then Is this must be true? The total number of trips should not decrease if I want this not to go down? No, it's not. Why? Because the miles per trip can go up. Okay? And this is the precision of must be true and the precision of pre-thinking. Had you done pre-thinking, right, you wouldn't have gotten into thinking about trips. Why? Because the pre-thinking would have helped you focus just on distance. That's the value of doing pre-thinking. Okay, so now average length of the same trip, same logic. The number of trips can go up. Think about it. All right, now we're gonna solve two very difficult questions. So far what we did was difficult. It was 700 level. Now we're gonna get to 750 level. And again, if you get them wrong, that's okay because you're here to learn. But what I want to emphasize through these two questions is, if you visualize this, then even these 750 level questions start to become easy. Okay, if you visualize this, even these 750 level questions start to become easy. So I'm going to give you this first question. It's RDS technologies. Now, because these are uber difficult questions, I don't want to time you. I would rather that you guys time yourself. So I want you to select this option called not answered.
I want about 50 people to choose not answered. And when you choose an answer choice other than not answered, then I know when 80% of you choose an answer choice other than not answered, that is. Okay. Let's remove this broadcast results. And now, thank you for that. And I'm going to show the question and uh, question number four. And good luck for this. Again, most people, I'll give you three and a half minutes to go really, really slow on this. Okay. I'm going to mute myself for this one.
All right, guys, pretty much everyone's done. Get those answers, and I'm going to give you another three seconds. Two and one. Let me end the poll. I'm going to broadcast the results so that you guys can see how you did. Now we're going to do another, solve another question. Let me hide this. I'm going to actually swap it out. Uh, another question here. Again, you guys know the, the drill. I want you to select broadcast results. I'm going to actually say 0% done over here. Um, I want 50 of you to say broadcast results before I show the question to you. Again, this is not the poll for the prior question. This is the poll for the next question. 50 people to say not answered. <coughs> All right, I have 50 people who've chosen, said not answered. Let me remove broadcast results. And here is the question. All right, guys, 70% of you are done. And my three and a half minute timer is also done. So I think we should get those answers right now. Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. I'm going to broadcast the results to you can see about 91% of you were done, only 11% are in that not answered bucket. Um, but you can see how you guys polled, and, and so this is fairly exciting. So these two really difficult questions. Uh, the first one a bit more challenging.
than the second one and uh, and, and and so again I'm, I'm sure you guys found the questions to be difficult as well so were they difficult did they seem difficult to you yes they were and so if you were confused eagerly waiting for answers again eagerly wait for the process the answer should be an automatic outcome all right so not our questions eg uh, these are these are official questions over in, the, in this case um, yes, there's, there's plenty to pre-think about. Here is something that I will tell you, you know, um, in the first question, or rather in either one of these questions, the logic is actually extremely simple. What makes them challenging are, you know, are different aspects. The first question, what makes it challenging is that there are multiple entities there. And if you don't read and visualize uh, right away, you're going to actually miss out on certain aspects. Uh, uh, and, and you're going to see that in the first question. The second question has a certain very peculiar kind of language, which again, if you don't catch on to it, you're going to miss out on that. But the logic in the second question is absolutely, I mean, it's the simplest logic that you can get. Okay, let's just visualize the conclusion for the first question. The number of Verlanders receiving special program information did not increase significantly between these two times. Now you can you can see it's, a, it's an older question. You're talking about 94 to 96. I'm sure about 70 percent of you weren't even born in uh, uh, during this time so so what are we talking about we're talking about when you think about the conclusion there are a couple of things over here one is the conclusion talks about special program information spi it is not concerned about anything else but spi uh and and uh, and then the second thing is is, is that it's talking about the number of uh, landers or V's, let's call them that way. You know, there's no, there are no brownie points for, for, for pronouncing word landers properly. Let's call them V's. That if that number was a million in 94, uh, who received the special program information, then in 96, that was also a million. It can go up by one or two percent or five percent, but not a significant increase. Can all of you see? Uh, uh, these two aspects of the main conclusion if it's 10 million then it remained 10 million if it was 20 million it remained 20 million so this is how you guys polled by the way in this case so so you guys know the, the response that you chose okay really important to understand and visualize this okay so Let's look at the argument structure. So the main conclusion is this last statement here. This, you know, the number of Verlanders receiving that special program information did not increase significantly in this time period over here. Now let's look at why does the author say that. The first thing is 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 is, is context. I'm going to go right from top over here. The context says radio stations. Radio stations. What are radio stations? These are stations that do what? What are radio stations? What's the job of a radio station? These are towers, yes. Think of them as cell phone towers. They broadcast, right? Now, they broadcast signals, yes. They broadcast wireless waves. Cell towers is a great way of looking at this. So radio stations with, with RDS technology, so with some special technology, broadcast special program information that only, the word only is a really important keyword. Why? Because it's, it talks about the fact that hey you that's a requirement only is the same as requirement or required that they broadcast the special program information that only radios with an rds feature can receive okay so what it's saying is that you have a radio station with this special technology called rds technology then you can get the special program information if you have a corresponding mating radio okay now what happened if statement one clear to everyone or in other words, if you as a receiver wants to, or as a, as a, as a, as, a, as someone who wants to hear this, wants to um, uh, wants to get the special program information, you need to be close to an RDS tower or a broadcast tower, and you need to have an RDS radio. Okay, between 94 and 96, the number of radio stations increased from 250 to 600. They actually went up quite a bit, but the number of receiving radios actually remained about the same if it was you know 10,094 then in it remained 10,096 okay and based on this the author is arriving at his conclusion okay now this a couple of other things over here statement number three is written to support the main conclusion statement number two 
is kind of going against it and you can see that why because of this word however which links statement 2 and statement 3 they go against one another and if we know statement 3 supports the main conclusion the main conclusion is built on statement number 3 and if there's a however linking these two statements and statement number 2 would probably go against the main conclusion and it just makes sense if you increase the number of towers you expect more people to receive special program information okay so far with me so far with me yes no all right okay so let's kind of look at this 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 argument over here between 94 and 96 very few additional world landers received rds uh, uh, rds programs what happened between 94 and 96 the number of rds radios remained the same the number of rds stations increased a lot and what's the context that's given to me to receive rds programming you need the rds radios and the transmitting stations and again every argument can be can be the, you can create a logical structure of, of every argument with, with these headings. You'll have the context, you know, if you remember the argument with the professors, the the, the report, research report was the context, and then you'll have the piece with support or, or go against the conclusion, and then you'll have the conclusion. And in your mind, if you can organize it this way, you're going to find that life becomes a lot easier. Okay. So, the question to ask is, in what scenario will there be a significant increase in the number of people receiving RDS programming if, you know, we don't have that many more radios, but we have a lot more transmitting stations? How, in what scenarios can we have this? How can we break my conclusion? Can you come up with some scenarios? In what scenario can I break my conclusion? More shared listeners, more people listen to one radio. That's wonderful. That's an excellent scenario. What else? Sharing radios is one thing. That's great. Well, but the same people listening more doesn't increase the number of people. Coverage increases if the cover range increases. Okay, if there's new, new stations... If they actually go and cover those areas where people had the right kind of radio but did not have, uh, but, but were not living in an area with coverage. So increased coverage and more people per radio. So here are the possible scenarios and you can really see what you are coming up with and what I'm coming up with. It's not very different, right? You guys can read my mind or I can read your mind or maybe because all of us are visualizing so we come to the same scenarios and that's kind of the power of process and, and visualization it, 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 you can now see that hey the smartness part is, is uh, off from it right you guys came up with the same things that I've come up with we've taken the smartness away we've, by, by putting the process in okay and, and that's that's important for you what are the two scenarios? One is if the additional stations now cover areas where, you know, people had the radios, but there was no coverage earlier. Is this clear? If this happens, then then my conclusion will, will, will break down. Clear? Yes? No? Yes? Okay. And if we start to put these radios in Starbucks, so if there are more people listening per radio, then this conclusion will break down. So my assumptions is, the assumptions are that these new stations should not increase the coverage significantly and the people per radio should remain the same. So, so far, whatever you've learned, is there any trick there? Is there any trick? No, it's just pure simple logic, logical approach to things and that's what you should do in, 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 in your entire GMAT prep. Let's kind of look at the correct answer. The correct answer is choice A. And I'm going to discuss every choice here. Why? Because very few people chose choice A. So, so again, the reason why many of you made a mistake is because you did not visualize what this answer choice is saying. And this is a very convoluted answer choice. This answer choice says, few if any of the RDS radio stations bega that began broadcasting in V after 94 broadcast to people with RDS equipped radios living in areas not previously reached, reached okay 
So, 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 man, this is very convoluted. So, I'm going to simplify this. So, what few, if any, means almost none. Okay, few, if any, of what of the RDS equipped radios that began broadcasting after '94? What are those radios? These are the new radio station broadcast to people with the RDS equipped radios living in areas not previously reached. What does that mean? That's increase the coverage. So what this choice is saying is almost none of the new radio stations increase the coverage of RDS programming. It's in line with our with our answer choice, uh, with our pre-thinking, and it is the correct answer. Let's kind of negate this. The negated statement for this is at least some RDS radios increase coverage. If the RDS radios increase coverage, then can I say with 100% with certainty that there's no significant increase in the number of people? No, I can't say with 100% certainty that that number of landers receiving special program information in, 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 in 1996 did not increase significantly. So that is why this answer choice is the correct answer choice. Okay. Let me clear all answers. Now I'm going to discuss every other answer choice, but you can really see how pre-thinking allows you to focus your energy. And if you translated this to this over here, you would have gotten down to this and chosen it. Let's look at choice B. <laughs> oh, there are lots and lots of questions. I can make a very similar question on, on something that's completely non-engineering related, by the way. Maybe I'll come at, come up with that question by the end of this session. Um, so, in 1996, most Verlanders who lived within the listening area of an RDS radio had a radio equipped to receive RDS. Let's, let me ask two questions. What's the definition of an assumption? What is the definition of an assumption? It's an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to hold true. Okay, unstated plus MBT. I like how you've how you've compressed that, and I want each one of you to remember this definition. Okay, what is my conclusion for this particular argument? What is my conclusion? The number of landers, the number of V's who got the special program information did not increase significantly. Everyone remembers that the number of V's who, who received SPI special program information did not increase significantly. Now. Now listen to me very, very, very carefully. Let's translate this answer choice. This answer choice says, in 1996, most Verlanders who lived within the listening area already had a radio equipped to receive RDS. Let's, assume, let's translate this answer choice into some number. Let's say 60%, okay, most is 50%, uh, slightly higher than 50%. Let's translate this to 60%. Now, let me ask you this question. Is it required that for, for, the, for the conclusion to be true, is it required that 60% of Verlanders, um, you know, who are within the listening area have an RDS equipped radio? Or in other words, would my conclusion not be true if 20% had an RDS radio in 94 and the same 20% had an RDS radio in 96? It definitely will be true. So is that 60% or is this most required? Absolutely not. Or in simple words, the conclusion is about the change in numbers from 94 to 96. It's not about how many people have that have that RDS radio in 96. People who chose choice B, do you really see why it doesn't satisfy that must be true condition? Can you also really see this is very similar to choice B in our in our highway miles question where we talked about the number of trips. It sounds attractive, but it did not satisfy the must be true condition. And that's what happens when you start to visualize. You can map answer choices, the logic of incorrect answer choices to one another. And that's, yeah, it is the power of visualization. That's all that you need. As I said, the first two things are, are important. The third thing, the pre-thinking question is a very natural outcome if you do this. Would it be correct if it says 94? No, absolutely not. Why is 60, why is most required in any of the years when the, when the, when the, uh, when the, when the conclusion is about, uh, 
essentially the change in numbers. I mean, think about this. If I told you that the number of uh, uh, the number of millionaires in America uh, uh, did not increase a whole lot between 94 and 96, then for for that conclusion to hold true, is it required that a majority of people lived in in America in 94 were already millionaires? Is that required? No. That's not a precondition. Let's look at choice C. Choice C, and, and, and I'm going to bring in how you guys answered this one. So we want to really see how, uh, how many people chose choice C. This is choice C talks about, uh, but 11% of you chose choice C. Choice C says, equipping a radio station with RDS technology does not decrease the station's listening area. It, it, now, special programming information. Can a radio station transmit special programming information if it doesn't have RDS technology? Yes, no? No. So, what is the range of special programming if, if a radio station does not have RDS technology? Zero. It's absolutely zero. It can't even transmit. So, when we talk about decrease in the station's listening area, is it talking about special programming or is it talking about non-special programming? It's talking about non-special programming, right? If it has an impact, it's about non-special. Do we care about that? No, we don't. The conclusion is only about special programming. So, and which is kind of the same reason for choice T, which is the most popular answer choice. And if you read the conclusion properly, you would have rejected choice D, just by just visualizing. In 1996, Verlanders who did not own radios equipped to receive RDS could not receive any programming. Do we care about people who don't have RDS? No. Do we care about any programming in my conclusion? No. Do we care about any one of these two things? No, not at all. People who chose choice D, can you see this? How do you visualize the conclusion? I said we only care about people who have the RDS radio. We only care about special programming. That's what the conclusion is. You would have rejected this and says, okay, is that must be true? No. Kind of? Why kind of? Any more doubts on choice D, guys? Very popular, the most popular uh, uh, choice amongst all the answer choices. Any doubt around choice D? It is wordy and plausible. That's the first step. You've got to translate it to simple a simple version. In other words, um, in other words, ask yourself, is it required that if I don't have an RDS radio, is it required if I don't have an RDS radio, then I'm not, that I shouldn't be able to receive any sort of programming from radio stations that have RDS technology? Is that required for the conclusion to, be ho to, uh, to hold true? When the conclusion only cares about RDS programming? No, it doesn't. And again, Remember, can these people share with RDS equipped, uh, equipped people? What are they sharing? If they're sharing an RDS radio, then they have an RDS radio, right? It's the same way. Let me just draw a parallel. If you don't have a 5G phone, is it required that from a cell tower that's that 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 uh, that's transmitting 5G technology, you not be able to even check your email? No, not really. You can receive 4G, you can receive 3G from there. No. And, and, and solve this question again, visualizing it, and, and you would learn so much from, from solving this question. 
type of programming is irrelevant okay so what about the theory of starbucks here sharing happens where is sharing written over here it's about receiving programming not sharing radios where do you see sharing if sharing were here i would have absolutely agreed but do you see sharing in choice d choice d is all about tower to radio it's not about radio radio sharing okay remember sharing is different and again this is the beauty of this is when you make a mistake you have to understand why did you make a mistake if you understood the logic of the argument properly and still cho chose choice d then why did you make a mistake what's the reason you made a mistake can someone tell me what's the causal part for eg matters who do strategic review what's the reason you made a mistake didn't read the answer well enough so what's your corrective action read the answer translate okay let's talk about the last question for the day and then we're going to really talk about how do you get to that 90th certain uh, uh, percentile okay so shelby will refuse here we're going to take visualization to that next level all right so let's assume last year we we collected a bunch of refuse and and we we did not send any for recycling we actually incinerated everything now i could not find a good icon for a truck so i have an icon for a trash can so if one trash can is equivalent to one truck how many trucks did we send last year for incineration this is incineration or burning over here how many trucks did we send last year all what's the count 10 okay the argument is up here for you to refer to all right so here is my question to you if this year if we collect the same amount of refuse how many trucks do you think we're going to send as per the argument how many trucks are we going to send half what is half of 10 five right now here is my question to you and i'm going to put in a poll question here and this is as simple as this if instead of collecting if instead of collecting the same amount of refuse if we collect 10 times as much refuse if that refuse is 10x 10 times as much refuse then how many trucks do you think i'll be sending for incineration this year if i sell if i if we collect 10 times as much refuse if this entity is 10 times as much as what it was last year how many trucks do you think we'll send for incineration this year? Three, two, read the argument, and then select an answer. Three, two, and one. All right, let me end the poll. Let me broadcast the results. Half of you got this question right, but only 24% of you, with those who chose five, understood the logic in this question. And, and and this language in this question is so beautiful that that i thought you know we need to have this question here because this is is also tells you why you need to visualize okay let's read the the language here this year city services will set the correct answer is five by the way if you didn't get it will separate for recycling enough refuse to reduce the number of truckloads to be incinerated to half of last year's number okay what they're saying is regardless of the how much garbage we collect i'm only gonna send half as many truckloads as we sent last year to be incinerated can you see that i'm going to separate for recycling enough refuse to reduce two is a purpose word the number of truckloads to half of what it was last year so if last year if we sent 10 this year i'm going to send five regardless of whether this number is 10 times what it was last year can everyone see yes no all right perfect okay and that's really important that's the level of understanding i want you to develop 
Okay, so last year all the refuse was burned, burning generated a ton of ash. This year we'll send half as many truckloads that we sent last year, we'll recycle the remaining. And the conclusion is the ash generated this year will be half of what it was last year. Frankly, if you look at this versus if you look at the highway miles questions, again, you can draw similarity. They had to increase the toll by 50% and the goal was to increase the revenue by at least 50%. Why would I assume 10 in the first place? Okay, can anyone tell me why would I assume 10 in the first place? What am I trying to do over here? What are we trying to do? Visualize, yes! That's the whole thing that we've been doing in this entire webinar, right? Visualize. Okay. Same question, falsification question. Under what conditions will the ash generated be more than 50% only if I'm sending half as many truckloads? What's the only condition in which I can generate 50%, more than 50% ash of what it was last year if I'm sending half as many truckloads? What's the only condition? If the concentration is more, more ash per truck, yes. Okay, more ash per truckload. That's it. That's the only reason. Forget about recycle. I don't care if you recycle something or if you put it in a uh, 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 put it in an earth pit. I don't care about it. As long as you're not burning it, it's not generating ash. Okay. If on an on every truckload basis I generate more ash uh, on average, then I'm gonna go. I'm gonna generate more ash overall. Is that clear? That's the only condition. The logic is as simple as that once you visualize the argument. So what's my assumption? The ash per truck load should be very similar to what it was last year. Again, go through the process. You will get to the answer. Let's look at choices A, B, A and B over here. This year, no some, no materials that uh, could separate for recycling would be incinerated. This is the must be true answer. The only thing is it doesn't provide any new information. You can infer this from the argument. And hence, because it doesn't provide any new information, even though it satisfies the must be true condition, it is wrong. You can infer this from the argument. Oh, you wanna see what you chose? Here is your answer choices. This is what you guys chose. You should be able to see a mark against your name. Against the choice, sorry, not your name, against the choice. Choice B is about cost. You know, we don't care about cost, we care about the amount of of, 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 uh, of refuse, so that's not true. Choice C talks about, oh sorry, that was the RDS poll. My bad, man, what am I doing? Sorry about that. Shall be well. Where shall be well? Here shall be well. Sorry about that. Here is shall be well. I get too excited sometimes. You guys can feel that. Okay, I'm going to curb my energy. Now, can you see the shall be well poll? No, no, it's not Red Bull. I'm a more of an espresso guy. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm very much into materials that that we've known for uh, 200 plus years uh, not so much the the new stuff all right so these are your polls you can see uh, choices c d and e were very popular choice a was somewhat popular now let's talk about choice c proportion of recyclable materials we don't care why why do we not care about choice proportion of recyclable materials because we are only going to send half as many truckloads okay people who chose choice c people who chose choice c is that clear folks who chose choice c c for cat is that clear yes perfect choice d is my correct answer it says 
the refuse incinerated per truckload will be will be no more than what it was incinerated last year again it's in line with our pre-thinking you can see the indicated statement you can see how it breaks the conclusion okay choice d is correct and choice e talks about the total quantity of refuse again we don't care why because we only send half as many truckloads for incineration okay if as you can see the negation test total quantity of refuse would, would be greater than what it was last year let's say even if it was five times does it have an impact no why because i'm only sending half as many truckloads as as was sent last year okay so why are they talking about separating the waste if they're sending half as many truckloads because they have to figure out what to separate it's it's the context they don't want to send recyclable material to 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 be uh, uh, to be incinerated okay that's why now what have you learned so far from this session what's what are your top one or two takeaways okay you've got to do pre thinking you've got to visualize it's it's really important you've got to go slow and then you've got to learn these small things such as negation and other pieces but yes i'm glad that you're thinking about visualization so let me just talk about what do you do next okay so first of all pre thinking is not rocket science okay and 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 and, and you've got to do pre thinking to achieve efficiency and accuracy anika says what if i what to do if i uh, uh, if i miss important words read slowly anika you've got to get into the habit of not missing those words and and which is where i'm going to come to so how do you get to that 90th percentile in in critical reasoning one of the pe big mistakes that people have is they feel like they should get to 90th percentile right away they don't measure their progress they 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 kind of really just keep an eye on that 90th percentile and yes while it's important to have that as a target in fact even put something like this on a wall it's also important to measure your progress okay so what is stopping you from 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 attaining a 90th percentile score the first thing is if you can't classify statements into facts premises anti premises or or conclusion in the first argument where we talked about tenured professors many of you missed missed out on defining which statement was the main conclusion and 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 many of you kind of couldn't build that logical structure if you can't do that you're going to falter so that's the first thing you've got to learn how to do and to do efficiently by the way if you can't do that you're also going to take longer so timing is an outcome of this the next piece is you don't visualize the conclusion and or the statements if you don't visualize the conclusion and or statements you do back and forth again you make a mistake you actually take longer Okay. In in many in, in starting from question number two, you 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 know for those of you who faltered, you faltered because you did not visualize that conclusion or that logical structure properly. The third piece is 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 understanding that logical structure. Now you you un, you 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 visual you can visualize the conclusion. You can visualize each statement independently. Can you now link those statements and 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 def, understand the logic that the author uses? and then do pre thinking okay if you can't do that you're going to get confused in the answer choices now remember 1 2 and 3 don't have any answer choices each one of these stop you from doing that and then as you saw in the rds technology um piece as you saw in some of the cases in as well as in shelby will refuse if you don't simplify the answer choice if you don't visualize the answer choice you are going to fail as well. you you could falter as well even if you do this correct this correct this correct if you don't do this you will still end up with this easy math students those of you who are in more advanced stages of critical reasoning what does this map to what does this map to any easy math student in the more advanced stages of critical reasoning the strategic review yes it starts with that clear foundation where it maps to the strategic review process we which by the way as pile go moves on to on to critical reasoning and in about 15 days you're going to really see some new modules in strategic review appear as well so 
these are the four reasons now your error log should be built on these reasons why is it important to build an error log on these reasons why is it important what does it help you do can you guys tell me a it yeah it helps you understand the behavior that leads to a mistake if you do this about uh, across 20 questions you know which behavior and which weakness is 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 is, is making you make a mistake right once you can zero down on mistakes you can avoid making those mistakes in the future and which is where an error log built on on these behaviors is really important to reach that 90th percentile you've got to attain this mastery on all of these grounds and you've got to do that one by one i'm not going to go into how to create error logs if you're an eg math student you have an entire set of error log modules that are available to you if you don't know that write to the support team and say can you please give me my cr scrc error log modules and and we'll then and, and they'll share those with you okay um and we have a two hour uh, about six to seven videos in each of these sccr and rc which which outline how to build an error log okay but the thing that i want you to take is you need mastery on each all of these grounds to make an error log okay now you've got to do this one step at a time you can't do all of this together don't think about doing all of this together so how do you do this and, and this is by the way in scholaranium for hard questions if you are at 90th percentile you can see for the last 20 if for hard question your accuracy is 65 percent you are at that 90th percentile okay that's what translates into a 90th percentile so let's see how do you build this fundamentals ability to classify that statement properly make sure you go through the premise and conclusion files diligently the guy who actually this is this person's account who is at that 90th percentile these are screenshots from that person's account just building that foundation you can see it's about you know two and a half hours of effort just to do this and 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 when you spend two and a half hours doing this with examples and and with these kind of evaluations over here these are not the fact that you've completed the file the fact that how you scored in the evaluations in there that's when you know you have the foundation now how do you make sure that you can learn how to visualize the conclusion these files help you do that and 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 and, and these are part of your free trial and again you can really see how much effort there are about 25 examples in here you can see the kind of time that's being spent on these files when you do that that's when i can really say hey you've been able to to build that visualization now step number three pre-thinking question and and an answer choices is across this is just the assumption module by the way and you can see the amount of time but the beauty of this is as you're doing this you have done this across 30 to 40 arguments and if you're doing this right you will have learned how to visualize arguments which not only helps you in assumption but it also helps you in evaluate it also helps you in strengthen weaken and all the other areas now one other thing that i want to really say is you can see how the argument structures how these files are divided by argument structures here pure logical graph one of the most fundamental things here we are comparing two entities here we are comparing segments here we have combined segments where entities and segments some of the most challenging 700 level challenging questions really do a combination of entities and segments okay and then we have a separate sort of pre-thinking file it's the same process it's just the structure of arguments is varied so that you learn one step at a time and that's really important so building that muscle uh, 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 you know building one muscle at a time helps build that CR strength and and that's what leads to that 90th percentile score okay so so this is something that I want if you're an EG mat paid student I want you to go through okay and, and and people do this I mean this is an incredible improvement you can watch his his interview on, on on youtube this is an entire 40 minute long interview and this guy was someone who's really good in physics and he thought he was really good in in logic but he kind of recognized he says hey language is a way of manipulating your mind and the gmat's really good at it just spend that extra five to ten seconds 
doing that pre thinking he didn't even take 15 seconds i mean the guy was shot but but he was still at that 570 and and you do that you'd be able to overcome most time most traps okay so as next steps go take a look at your free trial okay and you can do this in about 10 to 12 days if you're just doing this when i say along with your work of course uh so if you're spending 2 to 3 hours a day and slightly longer on weekends you can do it in 10 days okay with that um i want to thank you guys i can see there are a few questions but um let me share the session pdf and um, if you can in the q and a pod put in your feedback for the session that'd be great also because it's the beginning of the month we have i think for today and tomorrow we have a we have a deal going on where we are offering a 50 dollar discount so if you want to uh, uh, make use of that definitely do that so our youtube channel um for all the debriefs that are talked about and many more you can um, subscribe to our youtube channel over here and you can watch some of the debriefs uh in there as well um let me share the session pdf with you too session handout okay and again for those of you not connected with me on linkedin you guys can connect with me on linkedin and remember tomorrow we have our um, our algebra webinar okay and thank you for the appreciation and and you know you guys please stay safe and norman lewis is a book that i read when i was growing up so thank you for 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 that all right if you have any other questions not related to pre thinking well you can it can be related to pre thinking but not a specific example in this because i'm not going to go back to the session uh, but but in general if you have any gmat strategy or other questions you can put those questions in the q and a pod which is bottom left hand corner i'd be happy to 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 answer those questions how to work on four paths in the strategic review that's a really great question rinkesh says how do you work on the four paths which are then the strategic review mentioned separately most questions have multiple points involved so rinkesh first of all i think that's where when you go through the gmat course in the premise and conclusion module we're not asking you to come up with assumptions we are asking you to classify statements figure that out so that's one piece which is which is there um the second thing that is there is as and then we go through the inference module which helps you visualize so we have a, our inference module is probably our longest module and a lot of people think okay i get only a couple of inference questions at, at most in in on the test why is it that you know i uh, eg mat requires that i spend 5 days on inference the reason is because your ability to visualize statements helps you in every question not just in 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 critical reasoning but also in reading comprehension so 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 that's how we build those skills and then as you go into the assumption module we again go slowly over this so that's how you build those things okay now there's another question strategic review when should you start doing strategic review um in in this in the third concept in um, in 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 assumption module is when you should start doing strategic review anika says uh, what advice would you give someone who has 7 days before the test one i would say you know if you have 7 days before the test do not learn anything new your goal should be to maximize the score gain from your strengths don't focus on on fixing any more weaknesses that's you know the first and the foremost advice the second is how should you go about doing that um so the way i would do is i would class it, i would look at questions that i answered correctly but i took longer than the average time i would go revise those questions i would go real slow and um, and 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 make sure that that again i'm building that visualization on those questions and i'm rejecting them on solid grounds why do i say that you do this because these are questions where you have a really good sense of what the correct answer needs to be i don't want you to falter on similar questions on the test so again remember the principle is maximize whatever is your strength don't try and build new strength 7 days before the test because it will have an impact on on the strengths that you currently have um the third thing if you have not done test readiness which means if you have not taken enough mocks if you have not taken four or five mocks then do take a couple of mocks is is what i would say 
but but don't get disheartened by your scores your ability is is what your ability is today um, so so a week before the test i like people to relax i like people that i would recommend people that you know don't stop working out don't stress uh, it's just a test okay uh, you are someone who who aspires to make multi million dollar decisions you know this is a 250 dollar test you can take it again you focus on enjoying what you are learning focus on maximizing what you know and and you would do really well on the test if you if you stress out you're going to mess it up it's also a test which which tests that mental resilience by the way so if you really say man this is a test if i don't get a 730 i won't be able to apply to ross or wharton or 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 gsb chicago or my 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 life is going to go uh, a ray it will go a ray then but if you really just say it's just a test i know it i have these stats to prove for it then then you know you'd be confident so anak says i struggle to switch between sc and cr enough for length test sometimes it takes me 2 to 3 seconds to switch my brain onto these modes what do you do that's it's a great question a lot of people do that sonic and that's why in the three stages of learning we have the test right in that stage so here are here is what i do okay before the test i i take a quiz of 10 questions the ccr and rc and then another 10 question for verbal but even before i start that quiz i tell myself here is how i'm going to approach an sc question here is how i'm going to approach a cr question here is how i'm going to approach an rc question that knowing that process up front is 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 really important okay or or a kind of revising that process up front is really important and then i take a test right in as quiz it shouldn't be a very long quiz because otherwise you 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 go you kind of run the risk of uh, of uh, fatiguing yourself uh, into the test should be 10 questions it shouldn't be right before the test it should be you know an hour an hour and a half before the test uh, some people also like to revise those questions that they have solved so so again the goal really is to get yourself in the groove it's like you're doing the warm up uh, but you're not stressing yourself out okay so uh, hopefully that helps sonak but great question and again if you know how if you don't know how to build test readiness quizzes 3 4 10 days before the test then then write to the support team and um, and and they will share you the share the gmat strategy page with you which has you know the files videos on how to build test readiness quizzes ravina says i'll be starting prep this month is two months enough i don't know what your starting score ravina is i don't know what your starting abilities are but if you write to the gmat team if you write to me at rajadari-gmat.com then um, then someone will be able to and if you take a sigma x mock um, and then we'll be able to tell you whether two months are enough or or how many hours you need it's it's not the number of months it's exactly exactly the number of hours uh, that that matter so um, so so that's what i would recommend that you do let me uh, put in um, a link to sigma x mock um in in this over here so below my linkedin i think this is the correct link let me just check yeah it's a correct link so here is the link which is there it should be opening on your screen what's the accuracy of egmat mock score and the actual test very very close within 20 points how long does it take to complete the egmat course alex uh, to complete the egmat course will take 5 months the question is do you need to complete the egmat course and which is where we ask you to take a mock can remember this eg matters create 20000 personalized study plans every year at eg mat we are all about personalization okay we don't sell plain vanilla we sell a plain vanilla course but the course is the learning is personalized to you anika says do you have any tips to do when i get stressed during the test don't get stressed anika it's just a test i mean that's how i i tell people it's it's not your life it's a test enjoy it enjoy it enjoy the question in front of you just tell yourself you know i can't go back in time uh and, and and i can't predict the future all i can do is worry about the question um uh, at hand 
it's not easier said than done, Sonak. I mean, I practice this, uh, and, and and frankly, you know, uh, this is one of those skills. So when you think about the test, it's the test is not just about the test itself with regards to getting that score. That score is an outcome of you managing this part, right? I mean, why is it that uh, 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 that 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 the test should be any different than than practice? I mean, think about it this way: any sport you play, uh, when when you think about you know how people when they be great cricketers, the reason great cricketers are great cricketers is because for them they focus on a process. For them, a match is 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 the way they play in a match and the way they play in practice is very very similar. Similarly, when you think about you know great soccer players and 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 them taking a free kick uh, uh, near the goal post, the precision with which they go for their free kicks during practice and the precision with which they go for free kicks during the actual match is very very similar for them that match is 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 just another practice session, and the more you do this the the higher your chances of success would be it's about training your brain. And yes, it's 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 not super easy, but it's not impossible. And then there's a reason why only three percent of the people get a seven thirty score. It's people. It's not about learning, just learning the content. It's also about this mental aspect of the test. And again, don't make the test bigger than what it is. Rinkesh is another follow-up question. The consistency seems to be missing after going through the CR course once. Any suggestion on what to do? Simple mistakes keep repeating in some way or the other. So I wish English was like a formula. English is actually, GMAT English is like a formula, Rinkesh. Now, here's something that I will tell you. If you feel that consistency is missing, you probably had this feeling while going through the course. Why? Because every item on the course has evaluations. You would have missed the same things during evaluations as well. But you let those gaps creep in. You did not do those revisions right then and there. If you, had you done those revisions right then and there, you, you know all those bad habits, the four things that we talked about, are bad habits. We would you would have nipped those in the bud. And 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 so 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 again, how do you go about doing that? The new error log. That's where the strategic review process is very helpful. As you solve a question, it tells you which bad habit is forcing you to make a mistake. Once you know that bad habit, for the next 10 questions, tell yourself, I am going to do that. I'm going to visualize the conclusion. Doesn't matter how long it takes because you've got to build that habit. Rinkesh, that helps? Okay. And, and remember this, even quant is not a formula because if life were a formula, then everyone would get that 97th percentile or that 99th percentile. Then then, then essentially you won't have a, any means to go forward in life. Reading a question two to three times for better understanding, is that the correct thing or, or sh you shouldn't be waste time like that? Sri is asking that question. So Sri, I, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Okay. Now here is what, and, and it's going to get a, a slightly longer response. So remember this, the exam is an outcome and of, of your your ability, that innate ability that you take into the test. So so, um, and which means that you've got to build that innate ability. Now, if you practice while in the practice mode, which is in the cementing stage and the test readiness stage, if you are getting into the habit of reading slowly, for 80 to 90 percent of the questions, you shouldn't have to do that. And and that's 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 an indication indicator of this. For 10 to 15 percent of the question, even 20 percent of the questions, you may have to read them twice, and then that's okay. Why? Because if you inculcate those good habits, you won't have any timing issues uh, in the test, and then you'll have time to read them twice or thrice. On the other hand, if you don't practice reading slowly before going into the test, and I say before going into the test, 20, 30 days before going into the test you're going to have this feeling on 45-50% of the questions, which means timing problems are going to creep up, which means stress is going to creep up. And and that's something that, that you don't want. So so if you're following the right process, 
and and um, and and then you know on a on a few questions you'll have to read it and that's natural okay but remember this that 90th percentile guy that i showed his accuracy on hard questions was 65 to 68 percentage so you still make mistakes it's not that the 90th percentile guy does not make mistakes so hopefully that helps I started with the course work, working on the foundations course. Do you suggest taking an ability quiz or cementing quiz? No, Shrey. Cementing quizzes are in stage two. Once you finish a course, you finish an SC course, take SC cementing. Finish a CR course, take CR cementing. Finish an RC course, take RC cementing. Not before that. Okay. Write to the, 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 the strategy team and they will tell you when to take cementing. Does a bad mock test keep you way, way behind towards the goal of achieving? Um, uh, was achieving a good score? Let me just make sure I understand this question. Does it uh, keep you way behind? Yeah, does a so should a bad mock should should a bad mock test matter? Uh, it shouldn't. I mean, frankly, first of all, don't take a mock when you're underprepared. That's my my first principle. You should warm up, your mind should be fresh um, so, so that you don't have a bad mark. But if you have a bad mark, but if you're, all your other stats are there, then then I won't worry about it. And that's the, the, the value of, of, you know, the fact that we capture everything. We can really tell you what your true ability is. In fact, we can even tell when people are sharing accounts because, hey, you see someone's doing so well over there and then suddenly they take this quiz and, you know, those stats don't match up. Ravina says I'm planning to avail paid classes. It's still worth 350 bucks. Again, write to Sandeep um, or write to me at rajadaridachimat. And uh, again, the discount is I think today and tomorrow itself. So so we'll we'll send you a discount coupon if it's not in your email already. How much time must one spend on an average to complete the verbal and quant modules? Kirti, it depends on your starting abilities. And again, remember this: completing the modules does not get you the ability understanding that module gets you the ability and let me give you an example let's say your starting ability in sentence correction is 60 percentile now what that means is that you know you know most of the concepts you primarily have to focus on the application so even though you go through the egmat course in the concept files you'll do really well in the pre-assessment quizzes which means you probably won't have to go through a whole lot of files and 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 for you going through the egmat sc course is probably going to be eight days or so and then cementing is going to be another two days now let's say instead of 60th percentile uh, had you started with a 20th percentile you'd still go through the same course but you will likely go through about 20 to 25 percent of the concept files and about 35 percent of the application files twice why because it's a function of your starting ability so you'd probably take 13 to 14 days to finish the the sc course uh, on 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 properly to 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 hit that second level so it depends on your starting ability it's not about completing the course and this is one reason why we when we give you a study plan we give you a time estimate we don't tell you what you should do every day why because it's not about completing the course it's about understanding what's being taught and depending on your starting ability you might need longer or less time to understand okay Frankly, completing the course doesn't do that. This is not a CFA certification where, where everyone gets that or this is not uh, a you know, certification test. You are to be better than others on this test. Okay, That's when you when you get that admit to Harvard or Stanford or Wharton. That's when you get those, those that scholarship money. Okay. So, all right, guys, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you connect with me on my LinkedIn. And I'd look forward to seeing you in the session tomorrow and, 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 and in, in, the, in the coming weeks or so. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.